All right, well, I am so excited to be here. We are finishing up our last chapter in Jonah. We've got 11 verses to cover. Next week, we'll summarize the whole book again, maybe even watch Bible Project and see what they have to say about Jonah. Probably will make more sense having gone through the last few weeks covering these four chapters. We're looking at Jonah chapter 4, and we're going to go through it verse by verse. Since there's only 11 verses, what I do when there is a chapter that has 10 verses or less, I usually like to take and look at each verse and use one word to summarize it. It'll help me memorize it, help me uh, remember where I'm at in the story. I know this is 11 verses, it's a little bit more than 10, but to be able to um, say each verse, what's one word that would summarize it. And sometimes I give myself a leniency uh, and use two words, exceedingly displeased. Jonah is exceedingly displeased that God used him as an instrument for history's greatest revival. It wasn't Billy Graham. It wasn't for his glory ministry. It wasn't the Reformation even. This is a revival bigger than the Great Awakening where the whole city from the lowest surf up to the king himself repented. Even the animals repented. This is one, and, and he only used eight words. He basically said, this city is going down. He didn't even say why. He didn't even say who was going to do it. He didn't even offer out hope, apparently. He goes out there. He said, all right, God, you want me to go out there and preach the good news? Here it is. The city's going down. That's good news to me and my Israelite family. Well, I mean, in the previous lectures, we've heard about just how atrocious Nineveh and Assyria was. So Jonah was not the least bit pleased that the Taliban or that China or whoever else we might think of our great enemy, God's showing mercy to. And so he was exceedingly displeased and he was angry with God. And so in verse 2, we see accusation and justification. Jonah, thinking more of himself than he ought, went right up to God and poked him in the chest and he says, I knew this. This is exactly why I left. This is exactly why I went to Spain instead of obeying you and going east. And you know it. You're gracious. You're rich in love. You're abundant in mercy. You're slow to anger, quick to forgive, and full of grace. And you're so reckless with it. You're non-discerning. You have absolutely no discretion. You just do it. I knew this about you. Your love knows no boundaries. Ha! Huh. So he goes up there and he accuses God of this. Forgetting the fact that while we were yet sinners, God did his thing for us. While Jonah and Israel was doing their dastardly deeds, God chose them. That same love and grace that reached out to us, God uses to reach out to our enemies. And Jonah did not like God's recklessness and indiscretion. Not, con you know, not thinking about what the consequences are going to be if he does this. Whew. And so he was frustrated and he went right up and he accused God of the very thing that God was guilty of. Jesus on the cross. What did his accuser say? Thou sayest thou art the son of God. Guilty as charged. Thou sayest thou art the king of the Jews. Guilty as charged. And so God here is guilty as charged, just as Jonah accused him. But it's Jonah there trying to justify himself, acknowledging his disobedience in a justifying way instead of a humble, apologetic way instead of a confessional way. And so Jonah says, I had every right to do this. Started in the garden, didn't it? Uh, Eve says it's the snake's fault. Adam says it's Eve's fault. Matter of fact, God, it's not even Eve's fault. It's your fault because you gave me the woman. <laughs> and Jonah's here. I knew you were compassion and you don't want to punish anybody and you are quick to relent on ex executing judgment. <sighs> I knew this. In verse 3, we have Jonah letting life's circumstances, assessing the situation and the things that God is doing and not liking it. 
He doesn't like the situation. It's not going according to his script. This isn't how I would write my story. This isn't what I want for Israel. And so he says, take my life. How many times we get weighed down by the circumstances of life that maybe even God himself put in our path and all we say is, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus and take me out of here. Take my life. I do give Jonah a little credit here for at least going to God for it. We find him very often putting himself in situations that shows his death wish. Having the mariners throw him overboard. Do it yourself. Instead, he puts the blood guiltiness on the mariners. We find him wanting to end his life because it's not going according to the script he has for his life. This, this chapter is full of emotion. Verse 1, he was exceedingly displeased and angry. In verse 3, he, is, he is, wants to die. He doesn't want to live anymore. There is no purpose for living. Matter of fact, as long as you're going to keep doing nice things to the enemy, I know what the future holds. I can project the future. You're always going to be t t treating my enemies nicely and me meanly. I know this is how it's always going to be. And Jonah got sucked into that. It's easy to do. And he says, take my life. I don't want to live anymore. Life's circumstances are too overwhelming. It's not going according to script. And I'm not for sure I can trust you in the editor editing of my life or in the writing of my life and God asked him a question of mood is it right for you to be angry <laughs> he lets out like a you've got to be kidding me how blind are you let me, and he goes up and he gives God a history lesson. He says, let me remind you of who Nineveh is, what the Assyrians have done, just how brutal they are, how they'll skin people alive. Yeah, yeah, sure, they might chop off people's heads once they're dead and hang them on the city walls to warn people, but they will skin people alive after they violated them. And they'll do it in front of that spouse's eyes. They're just cruel. And so Jonah's given them a history lesson of how they treat humanity as a whole and particularly how they treated God's people. And he says, is it right for me to be angry that you just overlook all those crimes because they repent? Yes, I can't even believe you're asking it. He's He's, a, he's astonished that God would even ask such a question. Is it, right? I, it doesn't say that all in the text. It doesn't. Instead, what it has is, is Jonah huffing and puffing out of the city up to the hill on the east side. And you know how it is when you're angry. You slam the cupboards, doors. You clink the dishes loudly as you're washing them. You're stirring the pot with great emphasis so that everybody around knows what mood you're in, how angry you are, how aghast they are that they're so blind shut the door scream loudly drive out quickly let them know and Jonah was doing that he was stomping his way up the hill on the east side of Nineveh and he gets up there and he starts breaking off branches from the trees and starts erecting this structure of a booth putting leaves and branches over to shade it he's like and I have to build my own stuff when was the last time you've done anything for me I haven't seen your hand anywhere Forget the fact that he lived in the belly of a fish for three days. But he's, because he's in that mindset, he's not counting his blessings. He's not doing any Eucharist deo of thanksgiving to God for past mercies. All he can say is, I have to do it myself. I have to build this myself. I have to figure out how to get shade. And I have to, you know, and he's doing all this himself. And it's me, me, me. Ten times we see Jonah talking about me, myself, and I. You can make a song out of that. And he is fed up. He can't see it. And he's building his own self. Sure, you'll be repentant. You'll, you'll listen to these Ninevites that repent. But you can't even help me out here. You don't know the treacherous journey that I've been on to get here. God's like, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. Who think you gave you free fare from the Mediterranean? Anyway, um, so Jonah's up there on, on in verse 4 answering God's question is it right for you to be angry and Jonah says yes after he gives him a history lesson tantrums his way up the hill sits on the east side and he is hoping 
that my history lesson will have impacted God enough that he'll give Nineveh what it deserves. And so he's sitting up there on the east side overlooking this great city with the hopes that maybe his lecture got through to God and he'll see that the just and right thing for him to do is to destroy that city. It's worse than Sodom and Gomorrah after all. So he sits up there working, sweating, getting his booth all set up. And as the sun, as the day starts to end, God, in his mercy, had already set a gourd or a plant, a broad leaf plant to grow up, climb up the structure of the booth and have broad leaves shade over him as the night was setting, as the day was setting. Obviously, God had to plan all that ahead of time. He planted a seed in there so the gourd could start to germinate. He had Jonah pick that particular spot that all things started to work together. And up came this broad leaf plant. And Jonah's like, ha, this is an omen. This is an indication that God has come to his senses. He understands and sees it the way it ought to be. And so he says, he is starting to minister to me. He's starting to care about an Israelite, a circumcised Jew. This is, he takes it maybe as an indication that God is on his side. And so he is exceedingly glad, not just for the shade, but for God's favor being demonstrated through material, physical things. God is for me. And... You know, that's the way it is sometimes, is that when you're in a heated discussion with somebody, like God and Jonah were going at it, I told you this was going to happen, and God says, are you right to be angry? Absolutely, you're a temper tantrum, you're going at it. God just like, you know what the best thing for Jonah is, is to cool him down. Cool him down, I'm going to give him some shade, I'm going to let him calm down. That's the way. Sometimes we'll be in the heat of argument or being cranky, and we need to ask ourselves. We need to halt. Am I hungry? Then go eat something rather than risk relationships. Are you angry? Then take time. Count to ten. Cool down. Remember God's mercy. Are you lonely? Call a friend. You reach out to someone who just ministers to you. Are you tired? Take care of it. And also, for us ladies, is it, is it hormonal? Be mindful of that in our interactions. And so God just cools Jonah down. We'll have this discussion in the morning. And sometimes you just need to let that settle. Let it process. So Jonah's thinking, yes, God is on my side. Hallelujah. And then verse uh, 7 so God had prepared a, a plant to grow up and shade him just as the day was ending. And he's thinking, this is going to provide me beautiful shade tomorrow when I sit underneath this booth eating my popcorn. And hopefully God's going to rain down fire on Nineveh and it's going to be a joy. And I'll get to go back and report this to my brethren there in Israel, how God is on our side. And so he's very excited for the next day. God, on the other hand, in the next verse, has prepared a worm, a small, seemingly insignificant worm, to gnaw at the root of this plant so that the whole plant, it says, as the sun was getting ready to rise, when it would be needed the most, when the shade would be needed the most, as the sun was getting ready to rise, the worm does its dastardly deed and the plant withers. It perishes just when Jonah needed it most. And you can just imagine the emotion that filled Jonah in this. It's like, oh, I just got to do this whole thing by myself. God is so uh, unstable. He doesn't, he, he doesn't have good plans. He hasn't thought this out. If he would just ask me. And let me tell you, Jonah is not the only person that thinks these thoughts. How many times have I thought, if you just... Do it my way. If you just make an allowance for this, if you would just line my pockets, if you would make the world at peace, if you would cause a revival, you know, I could come up with all kinds of good plans. And so Jonah is 
upset. And as he's upset and furious, he's getting hot. God sends a hot east wind beating down on his head. He's hot from within. He's hot from without. And he is furious. And he said to himself, it would be better if I died. There again, life circumstances are hard. They are painful. They do cause us to faint. And we may even find ourselves within ourselves wishing we were out of the circumstances. And the best way we can think of is to go to heaven and die. Just die. And so Jonah makes no bones about it. I wish I were dead. I can't trust you enough. I don't know how you're going to get me through this. But God, very carefully, wants to finish last night's conversation. He wants to meet with Jonah. He's got a lesson in mind for Jonah. He's doing all this preparation, preparing the gourd, preparing the worm, preparing the wind, the heat for Jonah's lesson. He wasn't too receptive. Who can't identify with that? Who likes to be corrected? And who likes to have their visions and dreams crossed? Jonah didn't. And so uh, he says, I would be better off dead. It's very interesting, just to go back to verse 2, it says, uh, Jonah was exceedingly displeased and angry with the Lord, and he prayed. I love that word, and he prayed. I knew you were going to do this. I knew you just have absolutely no discernment. And God still calls it a prayer. All throughout, he's saying these prayers. We may even find ourselves praying this. Just take me. Come, Lord Jesus. I had a friend whose, whose tagline for her life was Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. If they were driving down the road and had a flat tire, they just think, now would be a good time for you to come, O oh Lord. If they were feeling pain in their stomach, they would think, now would be a good time for you to come, O oh Lord. Well, truth be told, any time is good for the Lord to come, but his appointed time will be the best. And it's not just a matter of extract me from these hardships, but teach me in these hardships. Draw me nearer to you. Let me experience you in, in these moments, in these difficult times. Give me faith. Give me trust that I can do that, just like Jesus could do when he was there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, but your will be done. So Jonah's praying that the Lord would take his life. And, and because he's hot, he's fainting. God's not doing, nothing's going his way. The, the broadleaf plant has died. Fire has not come down out of heaven to scorch Nineveh yet. And so there's just so many reasons why Jonah's like, nothing's going according to plan, just take my life. I don't like the fact that my husband's been transferred to Greenville. I don't like the fact that, uh, how did I get myself in this chaotic, messed up relationship? That last child that came four years, five years later that you had not anticipated at the time you thought, this is, this is so inconvenient. And now they're your greatest blessing over. There are just so many things where we're not on board with God's script. I don't want to be sent to Africa. I don't want uh, to be stationed somewhere else other than close to family. I don't like this job. How did I get stuck in this job? On and on. How did I get stuck in this house? The house is upside down. I can't get my way out. We all have situations in life that we did not brighten to our storyline. God did. Or maybe we wrote it into our storyline by our poor choices, but God's hand is not off of it. And we want to be like Jonah and just say, take my life. I feel stuck and I see no way out of it. Well, Jonah's thinking, oh, these people get saved. They'll be hardy and strong enough to come and destroy Israel. What he doesn't realize is that if these people get saved, they'll stop picking on Israel. So he wants to die. And God says, Is it, doest thou well to be angry about this plant, Jonah? 
And Jonah again wants to declare, I have a right. Of course I have a right. I have a right to be angry even to the point of death. I love that guy. I'm so thankful for this book. I have my own tantrums that look very similar. And Jonah has this tantrum. Of course I have every right to desire to be die. I am angry to the point of death. And God doesn't chide him. He doesn't say, no, it's just a plant. You have no business. It's not human. It doesn't have a soul. Soul, you know, you have no business. You know, don't be so sensitive that the plant died. Yeah, I, I like here that God does not chide him for caring about the plant, for being concerned about his own comfort. God doesn't say, no, it's not your right. He assumes that Jonah's going to say, yes, I have a right to be angry because he probably does have a right to be upset about it. You think there of how Solomon, the wisest of men, his reputation was world-renowned, and a woman, two women, brought their case before Solomon. And one of the women said, uh, this lady's son died. We both had a child at the same time. And this lady's son died. And then she took my child and claims it for her own. Have that lady give me back my child. And Solomon says, so there were two children and two mothers. Yes. One of the children died. Yes. That leaves one child left. Yes. And Solomon, banking on natural affection, just a naturalness that we are inbred with, he says, all right, here's hoping that somebody has a motherly natural infection going on here. He says, let's chop the baby in half and we'll give half of it to you and we'll give half of it to you. And of course, one, the first one was like, yeah, fine, good. I'll take the upper half. I'd like the upper half. And Solomon says, no, no, I'm cutting it in half. And whatever the case, this woman had no natural affection. She wasn't angry about anything. She wasn't concerned. Meanwhile, the real mother says, I will sacrifice anything. I will sacrifice my own happiness. I will sacrifice my life of getting to be with my son. Just keep him alive. She can have him. I'll, I'll, I'll disown him. I'll not claim him. Just don't cut him in half. It's very important to me that he stays alive. His life is more important than my life. Jonah didn't have that attitude overall. You know, the Ninevites' life is more important than my life. But just as Solomon was banking on a mother's natural love for the child and he was able to discern who the mother was. So Jonah, he says, of course I have a right to be angry. A creation is dying. All creation groaneth and travaileth because of the sin of man. And plus it was shading me and my comfort matters. And God didn't chide him. He didn't say, oh, you're so selfish, Jonah. He didn't say, oh, it's just a plant here today, gone tomorrow. That's the way all the flowers of the fields are. And God basically says, you are right. How much more then? He says in 10 and 11, how much more then should I care about Nineveh? Jonah, you didn't plant this. You didn't create it. You didn't water it. You didn't nurture it. You, did not, you didn't invest in this at all. You haven't even had a 24-hour relationship with this plant, and yet you are grieving over it. How much more shall I, who has created the Ninevites, who have nurtured them, who've tried to woo them, who've reached out to them through creation, through prophets, through uh, even bringing you here, they have my image. They are my offspring. I've created them. How much more then should I have, you know, can I have a heart towards them, a soft spot towards them, relent towards them? hoping for the best for them. We don't get Jonah's response in chapter 4. We just have Jesus, we just have God's lesson of the inclusiveness of his heart, the broadness of his love, the extent of his mercy. As the song says, the recklessness of his love that he'll even love our enemies. The fact that we have the book of Jonah, we're not exactly sure who wrote it, but most often it's attributed to Jonah himself. 
I feel like we get the answer. Jonah was willing to write this all down. Only Jonah would know the things that are going on. Only Jonah would know how the storm raged and the mariners threw him over and he was swallowed by a fish and he composed a prayer while in the belly of the fish. He Only he would know his emotional roller coaster of exceedingly happy and exceedingly angry and exceedingly happy and exceedingly... Only Jonah would know all these things and so more than likely Jonah wrote it and he recognized after God asked those questions in 10 and 11 God was right. The best way to conquer our foes is to turn them into friends. It's to see, the, see their heart changed. And it's an indication of where we are at as a nation of Israel. How prejudicial, how bigoted, how exclusive we have become. Jonah was completely satisfied with what God did recognizing the error of his way. It's, it's almost as he's writing this as a confessional, as if he's making amends to God and making amends to the Ninevites. Jonah autobiography gives us a warning about our own selfish way. It gives us the truth of God's incredibly rich in love, abundant in mercy, slow to anger, quick to forgive, always ready to pull back on the punishment uh, reigns if he can and it shows us the effectiveness of God's message the mariners end up getting saved the wicked city of Nineveh end up getting saved and Jonah didn't say but five to eight words how much more powerful of a gospel message do we have in sins forgiven in Christ Jesus the love that he displayed by giving us his only begotten son and take heart in knowing that God uses even reluctant people, even prejudicial people, even people who uh, think that the right thing for God to do is to let my ex-husband know <laughs> it was for him to go bankrupt. <laughs> God will use even us in the lives of those that we count as enemies. Next week we'll cover, uh, we'll summarize up these four chapters. Let's pray. Gracious God, we do marvel. We know we will never be able to understand or comprehend the depth, the breadth, the length, the height of your love. How far outreaching it is that we can never out love you. We'll never be loving somebody and think, oh, I should pull back on that love. I'm probably giving too much. Lord, we can never out give you and we can never out love you. So help us to be a people who are loving. You declared there in that great priestly prayer in John chapter 17, they shall know we are followers of you by how we love one another. So help us to love one another like that. To be all inclusive, to be um, reeking out, even to enemies, even to people we don't think, whether it be nationally like the Taliban or the China or Iraq or Iran, whoever we count as our enemy, but also personally in our own community, people that we think don't deserve it. Our boss, our siblings, our parents, on and on it could go. We pray that you would do a work in us like you did in Jonah, effectually. Lord, and we do pray for a great revival. We just can't think of a better answer to the needs of this world than to see the love of Jesus being spread abroad. And we pray, Lord, use whoever you want. Use whoever you want. Doesn't have to be a Lutheran, Missouri Synod. It doesn't even have to be a Lutheran. You use whoever you want just to see hearts changed and drawn nearer to you. We love you, Lord Jesus. Amen.